There is revival going on at Ashbury, and there are five dangers that we must discuss. All right, so danger number one is that you could become a critic. So we are in a state in our country, even in the world, where there is so much information. There are so many things that are coming at us that are false, that our tendency is to point out the wrong in everything that we come across. And we are becoming critical of everything. We don't, we don't kind of try to understand where people are coming from or give things the benefit of the doubt. We just immediately become a critic. That's fine. I get that. But you're wrong and I hate you. And the problem with immediately becoming a critic is that we are never seeing any truth. We are only seeing lies. And if we live our life in a way that we are only looking for lies, but we are never meditating on the truth, we actually don't move ahead. We just kind of sit in a state of hopelessness. A critic is a hopeless person because they are not trying to communicate the truth to anybody. They're only trying to point out the falsehoods in others. Danger number one. Danger number two is the danger of being a naturalist. So naturalism is a school of philosophy that was uh, popular in the 1930s, 1940s. And what they said is that all things can be explained by the natural universe that is around us. There's nothing outside of that. The natural universe is everything. Uh, there's a little bit of a trick here. If what is natural is considered what exists, but there are states that in existence that are unseen that we can't necessarily see, that would still technically be part of the natural order of things, even though it's not something we can see. So a naturalist, the, the problem with kind of the naturalist philosophy is it's not just what exists, it's what we can know. So truth and reality is determined by what we can know. I'm an angel. Yeah. No, you can't be. Why not? Because I'm an atheist. Not anymore. How is this a danger with the Ashbury Revival? Well, let me tell you. Often in the Western church, we have come to a point where anything that happens in the supernatural, we immediately push against it because it cannot be explained. So if somebody says somebody was delivered from a demon or somebody spoke in tongues or there was a miracle or there was this amazing thing that happened, we are skeptical right from the start. And, you know, not everybody, but just a, a portion of, if not the majority of the Western church kind of operates in this way is that we are distrusting of the supernatural. Maybe this is because of counterfeits, maybe this is because of abuses, but it is a danger for us to fall in. If we find ourselves that anytime someone tells us anything that isn't kind of in the, the, the scientific norm of understanding someone's supernaturally healed or someone, you know, has a deliverance of some way or, you know, there's some kind of interaction that goes beyond the natural order of things that we would, you know, quote unquote, say is natural, uh, kind of expected, then we would disregard that as a falsehood. If that's our first impression, not to test the spirit and see, like, is this something that is reality, but that we would disregard it and say, no, I don't believe you. If someone has to prove to us that the supernatural exists, then we don't really believe that the supernatural exists. Danger number three, that we can be lukewarm. We might say, you know what, I am just tired of everybody fighting. I don't care what's happening in Ashbury. I don't care if people are worshiping. I don't care if people are having false teaching. I don't care what's going on. It doesn't affect me. Well, in Revelation 3.16, it says that you are neither hot nor cold. I'm going to spit you out of my uh, mouth. And this is to the letter in the church of Laodicea. We cannot just be indifferent about things. We can't just disregard things. You know, many people will kind of look at um, the Asbury Revival. I've, I've heard this numerous times that it's just like kind of an emotional sing-along as though that's a wrong thing. If you lack emotion in your worship of God, you are lukewarm. And that is a danger to God. And if you discount a movement of the spirit because it's emotional, you are being intellectually prideful and saying that my intellect is greater than your emotion because I am not ruled by my emotion and you clearly are. And I would say if you talk to your spouse like that, you're going to have a difficult marriage. I had it with you and your emotional constipation because emotion is an important part of relationship and passion is an important part of our relationship with God. And if we look at the Asbury Revival and we discount it because there is a lot of emotion going on and we somehow think that God is a God of intellect, not a God of emotion, we don't know all of God because God is clearly 
a God of emotion as well as intellect. Neither is exclusive to defining God. Both are parts of his character. Danger number four, the danger of becoming a consumer. So we live in the United States, at least a capitalist society, kind of still. Uh, we are always looking for something better to buy, something better to look for. You know, like we, we get involved in this kind of cycle of consumption. And if we're not careful, we can turn that to our faith. Your faith can become, I want to better myself. I want to improve my understanding, improve my knowledge, improve my holiness. And it all kind of becomes about you. And the Asbury Revival, when things like this happen and they kind of go social media crazy and, you know, it's, it's being spread around and people are coming to it to have that experience, if their experience is the thing they're searching for, that can be dangerous, right? If the desire for your faith is to consume as a glutton so that you can enjoy the consumption, not so that you can be fueled and changed by it, that's the difference between a healthy diet and a unhealthy diet. Spiritually, we should consume the Lord. We should be consumers of what he is giving us, but that consumption should then lead to action, lead to us living a life affected by those things that we've consumed. We cannot simply be a consumer. We have to be a creator. We have to take these things that God has given us and cycle them through into creative action, into movement, into, to, you know, I'm not talking about just like creating paintings and pictures and things like that, but actually creating life, creating culture, being part of the process of God, uh, impacting the world for his kingdom. We cannot simply be consumers of the kingdom. We have to be partners in creating and advancing the kingdom because that's what he tells us to do, to go out and make disciples, uh, go out to all the world and, and let the gospel be known. All right, number five, the last danger that we're going to look at and talk about is the danger of being a distraction. One of the things that I have seen a lot in the conversations online about the Asbury Revival is discussion on what it is. Rather than what the purpose of revival is, we have to remember, like, revival is not even a biblical term. There's no, like, biblical teaching on this is what a revival looks like, or this is the definition of a revival. Revival is something that we talk about in a historical context. And there are endless discussions about, is this a revival, is this not? I actually think, I've actually thought about this one a lot, and there was a lot of things I wanted to say. But rather than me saying them, I actually want to let you see what Mark Driscoll had to say about that, whether you like Mark or not. I think he said this one really well. Some uh, pastor friends have been asking about the quote unquote, Asbury Revival in Kentucky. I think it's awesome. I'm praying it's genuine. I'm praying it sticks. I'm praying it grows. I'm praying it expands. For those of you who are a little more controlling and a little less trusting, for those of you who want to sit back and be a critic rather than be a worshiper, I would just tell you that God is free and God can do as he pleases. And I I hope and I pray that what is going on is pleasing to him. It sure sounds like it is. Kids reading scripture, giving testimony, singing songs and praying. Oh my gosh, that that just, I mean, I'm a dad. I just want to cry. That brings tears to my eyes. For those who would have concerns or questions, there's a, a rabbi named Gamaliel. He's in Acts chapter five. And when the awakening, the movement, um, the revival, if you will, of Christianity began, uh, there was a discussion among uh, sort of religious leaders in that day. Should we support or oppose this? And he says from Acts 5, if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. I hope pray it continues. And uh, I'm praying that it is the number that spreads across the nation, spreads across the campuses, because people need Jesus. And without a touch of the Holy Spirit, life doesn't make any sense and it doesn't have any meaning. Okay, so that's everything that uh, I have to say as far as the five dangers that are coming out of the Ashbury Revival. Maybe not the ones you thought they were. If you thought this was encouraging, if you liked it, if you think what we're doing is worth getting behind and supporting, helping us hopefully advance the kingdom, let Christ be known to others, please like, share, subscribe, send this out to somebody that you know, sign up for our email list, and uh, follow us online.